And uh, my good morning to you as well, even though it's almost completely gone. I invite you to bow your head with me for a little introductory prayer. Dear Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit here in our midst this morning so that our minds can dwell on things eternal as we seek to lock out the world for a few precious minutes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Unsurpassed the title of my message today. So let's see if we can glean some worthwhile thoughts from scripture associated with the fascination of this word, unsurpassed. Some time ago for the sermon hour, we were privileged to hear and view a set of presentations on DVD that featured a few of our gifted overseas speakers. I think the series was titled, If I Had One Sermon to Preach, which was challenging these guys to share that which was dearest in their hearts in respect of a Christian experience. I can't remember the contents of them all except to say that I was impressed and blessed with each one's contributions along the lines mentioned. If I had one sermon to preach, I know some of you will automatically think along the lines of the famous poem. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Meaning, of course, the genuine Christian life lived for Jesus Christ is the ultimate sermon anyone could ever preach these days in a world that is so cursed with sin and influenced with evil. Of recent times, I've prayed that the Lord would give me a theme I could work at, as is my usual practice, with regard to a sermon that would benefit the Wangarei congregation and myself in its preparation. And then I felt impressed and began thinking, why not try for my own personal thoughts on what I would present if, in my case, I knew my days were numbered and had but one chance to relate the dearest thoughts of my Christian experience. After all, I've been along the Christian pathway for quite a number of years now and negotiated a few potholes and pitfalls along the way. So I guess by now I too should be able to give you the personal thoughts I would pursue and the subject matter or topic in God's word that would be the basis of a final one-off sermon. And that could well be a reality, seeing my ticker has had quite a bit of repair work done to it over recent years, and it probably won't last too much longer. So what should I touch on or recommend in a final sermon? What facet of God's plan of salvation do I consider to be for me that which transcends all other beneficial material to be found in God's word. Now, as you would all know, being students of God's word, there are literally hundreds of topics and or variations of them that one could share or promote in such an exercise. So why don't we at this stage consider some of this potential material from God's word? But first go through an elimination process and hopefully you all agree at the end that I've chosen a subject that should supersede all others. And I'm sure and hope that most of you will know how my ultimate choice will turn out. So what say we begin first with this elimination process because there is such a lot of study material in my opinion, that couldn't justify mention 
or qualify as having merit for such an important promotion. For example, one wouldn't work up a sermon on the state of the dead, even though there are a massive non-biblical biblical perceptions on this doctrine which require correction, but which, in re really, which is really a study item only on basic Bible truth. So elimination number one. The health message of this church, i.e. the right arm of the message as is suggested by Mrs. E.G. White. Numerous sermons preached on this subject, beneficial ones at that. But would any of you folk promote above all else such as a final message to others? I think I know your answers. So elimination number two. What about the sure word of prophecy, the mighty 2,300 day or year prophecy of Daniel 8, or the great image dream depicting the world empires right down to our present day of Daniel 2? Tremendously intriguing, inspiring, but not as a final sermon to my way of thinking, however, fantastic study material to bolster one's faith. Elimination number three. What about the law, God's Ten Commandment law, the moral law including his seventh day Sabbath with all its associated blessings of worship and rest, etc.? Maybe. But this topic as well, in my opinion and choice, could not constitute the personal satisfaction that I would seek to share with you in a final message. Elimination number four, therefore. Now this next topic might get some thinking it could have a possibility. How about the satisfaction to be derived from being a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Worldwide Church? Divinely blessed, for sure, with God's commission to share with the world his everlasting gospel truths and the three angels' messages from Revelation 14. Many, many such truths being foreign these days and unpreached from the pulpits of a lot of other churches throughout Christendom. Has merit, hasn't it? And I believe it could attract some to think it could be an appropriate final sermon. But is salvation and eternal life guaranteed when one becomes a member of this church? Is the membership of this church an automatic ticket to eternal life? My answer is an emphatic no. And if it offends someone, I'm sorry about that. So to me, it's elimination number five. At this stage, I think it's appropriate to state that God's desire is still that we appreciate the worth and value of our first five elimination topics. But none would attract me personally as a final sermon, so let's move on. This next batch of potential topics deserve a much closer delving into. For instance, God's promises as spread throughout the scriptures. But no, I would even have to discount the beauty that is contained in many of these, so not for my final delivery. What about the signs of the times, the end signs that include and lead up to the second advent? I know our late, late brother Wilson Booter from Dargaville would have no qualms about making such his final sermon. And if the truth be known, it probably was. But again, personally, I would have to reject the urge to centre my final thoughts on this subject exclusively. The Psalms are so beautiful 
and one could very easily be tempted to work up a final message from the beauty contained in some of these. I would not hes hesitate to give it some serious thought, but there are still some other considerations. So let's continue and check some of these out. Here's one that could have terrific promise, but question first. How can a born-again Christian person survive except he has developed a prayer life that continues to enhance a relationship with the Godhead, especially with Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I want to repeat that. How can a born-again Christian person survive except he has developed a prayer life that continues to enhance a relationship with the Godhead, especially with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I'm sure many a preacher could build his final sermon based on prayer, especially God's response to maybe an answered specific request of him. Maybe a miracle. However, as for myself, I would even choose to bypass this wonderful topic as well, seeing I know in which direction my thoughts are heading for during these few minutes I have left to share with you. So rather than an elimination, let's say a real possibility this time. What of heaven, the millennium period in heaven, the new Jerusalem? the refurbished planet Earth, etc., etc. Amazing positive material. But as a final say, they also would have to be another no for me. But as with prayer, a real possibility. Question. Where might each one of us be today if it were not for the Holy Spirit's influence and guidance of God's everlasting gospel truths. As for myself, it doesn't bear thinking about. I could very easily be just another unnecessary lost soul on God's planet Earth. Another great possibility, but I'm still looking further ahead for my personal choice of a final sermon. And what about Paul's letters to the newly formed various young churches of his day? Brimming over with messages of prospect, admonition, encouragement, that could very easily be the backbone of a final sermon. And I feel certain some of his material has been used to great spiritual benefit on some final occasions. Again, another super prospect, but another no for me personally. There are just a few more I have chosen to briefly touch on. The heavenly sanctuary question, baptism, spirit of prophecy and judgment, creation, etc. Great study material for me anyway over the past 70 odd years. And the sealing of one's commitment to Jesus Christ, i.e. baptism. But hardly the basis of a final sermon. I trust you may agree. Now there are a multitude of other variations along the themes of all I have briefly mentioned, plus many other topics in God's word that one could develop as a, as a meaningful final sermon if I had one sermon left to share. Some of you could be thinking, there's not much left, Basil Ford, only crumbs. So where are you leading us? Seeing you have encompassed a large and significant array of Bible truths or tenets of this church, and haven't as yet given us a clue as to your personal choice of the subject matter dearest to you for the purpose of this exercise today.
question. How many senior persons in our congregation today can still remember anything significant or dramatic that happened to them in their young lives when they were around two and a half years of age? Possibly some of you can recall an incident that has stayed in your memory bank. I can, and in pretty graphic detail, actually. My elder brother was five years old at the time. I was next at two and a half, as mentioned. And my mum's third son, my younger brother, was 15 months. My mother had been visiting a neighbour friend and during her attendance of my younger brother, it seemed I had wandered off and had headed out and over to the edge of a small lake unbeknown to her, of course. She thinking I, I was just outside the door. I seemed to have had a fascination for water, as most children do, still do, incidentally. And as stated, was soon at the lake's edge and feeling like I wanted to try out this new experience. I toddled through some waterborne weeds and then came to a bit of a drop-off. Clinging to these weeds, I suddenly realised I was in water up to my neck and shoulders. So I clutched a little bit more desperately to a clump of these weeds. All this I can vividly recall in my mind. As of now, even after 76 and a half odd years, I wasn't crying or yelling out, but knew in my young thinking that I was in real big trouble. My elder brother had just started school and knew that after school he was to return to this neighbour's place. I can still see him coming down this track with his small school bag and looking over to the lake's edge and seeing my head only and me making distressed pleas for help. Luckily for me, he very quickly assessed the situation and without first running for help, bent down and gave me the straps of his bag to hang on to. As I let go of the weeds one hand at a time, he of course had to keep clear of the drop off. Then he pulled me out and to safety. I don't remember anything that followed. I believe to this day that my brother had saved me from possible drowning. But what if I had only one chance left in which to convey my final thoughts for a one-off sermon? One chance only. What would my thoughts have to centre on, seeing I have already discounted so much other biblical material? Maybe some of you could think of a subject I've not mentioned thus far a subject that could be ideal, the ideal one for such an occasion. Well, I should come to the point, even though I'm sure most of you have already guessed what my topic would have to touch on. So what about a person who has saved my life for his everlasting heavenly kingdom? My elder brother was responsible for giving me extended life over the past 76 and a half years, for which I am naturally most grateful. But this other person has saved me for eternity, which is way, way beyond any period this present life has to offer. My brother did not have to sacrifice his own life in order to save me, but in stark contrast, this other person had to forfeit his life to effect my salvation. And he voluntarily did so, realising the possibility that he himself could die an eternal death in the process. At this stage, uh, 
my sermon time is now about down to half, so what's left would have to exclusively be about Jesus Christ, who has saved me personally and presently and will save me one day for eternity into his everlasting kingdom of love. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou, Mary, his mother, and Joseph, shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus later said, I came not to judge the world, but to save the world, to save individually, that implies, and it's always been that case. A personal saviour for every last one of us, that is, and not as a church body or group, but each one individually, the scriptures stress, for we have all individually been bought with a price. Our sinfulness, sinfulness had to cost the Godhead for reconciliation to take effect. Jesus, God's Son, was required of his Father to meet this indescribable cost. God's love had been reborn in the life of his Son, Jesus Christ, and the benefits of his sacrifice became available to all who thereafter would become his beloved sons and daughters. Amazing grace, or God's favour as I like to think of it. Because he loved humanity, his creation, so much, he was prepared to pay redemption's ultimate price to save me and to save you folks, yes, individually, that is, for God so loved the world or his created humanity that he gave his only begotten son as a sacrifice, that is, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so God's plan of salvation or the gospel is all about being personally saved and has to me to be the most significant aspect of the entire scriptures involving the personality of Jesus Christ and him alone. And she shall bring forth a son and his name will be Jesus for he shall save his people from their sins. He will also be known as Emmanuel, meaning God and the now person of Jesus Christ had come as promised to humanity to, to promote his Father's love to a sin-ridden world, otherwise destined to destruction. He would come to encourage, teach and to demonstrate what the ultimate expression in love entailed, which would be compassion, mercy, selflessness, humility, long-suffering, thoughtfulness, meekness, etc. And yet awesome in power if the occasion arose where he had to call upon heaven to come to his aid in his daunting task of dealing with sin and its consequences plus its originator. And so Mary brought forth a son and he grew and nurtured until he reached the age of 12, having in those formative years of development shown extraordinary character, being filled with wisdom and blessed with the grace or favour of God, his true father. He had travelled up to Jerusalem with his mother and stepfather to the feast of the Passover, it seems there would have been additional siblings by this time, and their care could have been the reason that the young Jesus was left unattended. After all, he would have been a strong young lad and well able to care somewhat for himself. The family was now in the process of returning home and was possibly part of a large group comprising as well their 
couldn't spoke. A day's journey had been completed, most probably on foot, but when the young son was sought, he was not to be found, even amongst his kinsfolk. So it was a return trip to Jerusalem to find him. And finally, after three days, he is found. He's actually back in the temple, sitting in the midst of doctors of learning, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Now in this situation, his parents at last discovered him in the temple. They too were amazed, having observed this discussion group with their son at only 12 years of age, more than holding his own in matters of wisdom, knowledge and understanding. Son, note the mother is speaking, tears welling up in her eyes. Why have you caused us all this worry and sorrow and the extra travel time we've had to undertake? But mother, even you don't understand. I've got to now begin attending to the assignment given to me by my real father, and I couldn't pass up this opportunity of making a start he would have expected of me. My father's business. But none could comprehend the real significance of his reply. The young Jesus was in training and by the time he had reached the age of 30, he was the fully accomplished Messiah, Emmanuel. God had arrived in the person of Jesus Christ and for the following three and a half years he would live the life or purpose of his true father which was a life dedicated to the rescue of the human race from sin. The mission to save had been born in the flesh as against previously when it had to be acquired in faith of a promised Messiah or Saviour to come. As an example, although entirely unnecessary, Jesus requests baptism of John. Unnecessary? Not really, because his father right now wanted to bestow upon him his credentials required for the work of salvation. Baptism would ignite his passion to show his father's love to mankind. Let's spend a few moments on some of the finer points associated with this very beautiful occasion. It's in wilderness areas around the River Jordan that we find John being impressed by the Holy Spirit to promote the rite of baptism for the remission of sins. This was also incorporating preparation for the imminent arrival of a Messiah to prepare the way of the Lord. Many in the multitude actually thought him to be the Christ and repented accordingly. In the meantime, though, he lectured them on where they had fallen short in their ungodly ways. God's Spirit was powerfully working through him as he continued to baptise in the Jordan. Finally, he was able to convince the multitude that he was, in fact, not the Christ that had come but merely the forerunner of him to come, not even worthy to loosen the straps of his footwear. When he comes, his baptism will be the Holy Spirit's infilling of your hearts and fire will do the purifying. So Jesus makes his way up from Nazareth of Galilee to the River Jordan and observes all this activity taking place just out from the water's edge. He knows in his heart that his time has arrived, and he knew his father's will was that he too should go through the same rite, even though he was so different to the multitude, and in no re need of repentance, being sinless. Nevertheless, he inquires of John as his turn arrives to enter the river, but Jesus 
I'm not worthy to baptise you. You should be baptising me instead. John had instantly been aware of the divine one in his midst that had no need at all of baptism and he balked at Jesus' insistence. But John discontinues with his objection and Jesus takes his place at the side of John and is immersed in the waters of the Jordan. Between them, they had fulfilled all righteousness. But the multitude was about to witness an amazing spectacle, for as Jesus came forth from the water, the heavens were suddenly opened to him, and he saw his Father's Spirit descending like a dove and alighting on him. A powerful voice from heaven follows, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This was his father's approval or signal that would launch him into the rescue business of individual human lives, thus giving persons the choice thereafter of a superior life to be lived in heaven one day, at which time the redeemed from all the past ages would be saved by grace for eternity. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. But it was destined to cost him the ultimate cost, and he knew it. However, in the meantime, he would need help, as it would be a joint work. Twelve guys, so I think we could sum them up, were drawn to him like a magnet. The Holy Spirit was beginning to work in a profound way. One of these men would later write, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Jesus was this name. And with these 12 men, they would become the most powerful force Satan would ever encounter, as he was to find out when he tried his hardest to test and tempt Jesus over a 40-day period, a sustained period when he was weakened for the want of food. But Jesus was well fortified. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. His Father's power was now available to him. As well were these hand-picked men who had recently and readily given up their livelihoods to assist him. Miracles were now to become the order of the day. Fill those empty water pots with water, he requested. Then draw some of it out for the governor of the feast who was presiding over the marriage of Cana. It had been instantly changed into wine of the very best quality. His fame was naturally spreading rapidly. He began to teach in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He also began to heal all manner of sicknesses and disease, deranged persons, those taken with all types of infirmities, diseases, torments, devil-possessed and lunatics as well as those suffering from palsy, all were healed instantly. Multitudes were being attracted to him and his little group of men. Then one day, when he sought some respite from the multitude, he made his way up this mountain or high ground. And when he was settled, he called the twelve up and gave them a little lesson on the various makeups of folk who were blessed with some of his father's character. He wanted this lesson to sink in as they encountered human nature of all kinds. There are some you will find are poor in spirit. Well, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Some will mourn because of any number of reasons. These unhappy folks will assuredly be comforted. Then there are those who are 
whose nature is meek, well, one day they will inherit the earth in a much better state than it presently is. There are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They too will be filled with satisfaction. There are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. All of these folk will be appropriately rewarded. Blessed, blessed, blessed sums up my Father's good pleasure of all those blessed with such attributes. But sadly there are those who persecute you, invent evil against you, and slate you for your righteous living. Well, just rejoice if you can because your reward will be in heaven one day. All these such folk are the salt of the earth. Now, in conclusion, I would like to touch on a few specifics from Luke's Gospel. As a teacher, Jesus was unsurpassed. Those privileged to hear him were astounded, astonished and amazed. The officers sent to arrest him said, never a man spoke like this man. With regard to knowledge, here again, he was unsurpassed, for he was the co-creator of all things, animate and inanimate. His numerous parables were all in the master class category. He was, in reality, the master class tutor in all of these. Unsurpassed in the practical examples of human well-being, Prayer was his lifeline to his Father in heaven. That being so, his prayer life was unsurpassed in intensity and relationship. Sometimes all through the night, out in the wilderness, just him and his Father. As a preacher in the synagogues on the Sabbath days and even from Peter's fishing boat moored just out from the lake's shoreline. Unsurpassed in holding a crowd spellbound and inspired. The wisdom of King Solomon, no, because Jesus' wisdom outshone by far the, that of King Solomon. His wisdom was unsurpassed and derived from on high. I know you guys have toiled all night and caught nothing, but this time, let the nets down again, right now. The disciples couldn't handle the massive haul of fish that resulted, unsurpassed in his control of wildlife. Sleep in a small boat while an angry sea was raging. Wake him up, lest we all perish. In an instant, there's a flat calm with not a, not a breath of wind. Unsurpassed in his control of any one of the elements, he had once programmed them all in harmony and unity. He would, therefore, always be in control of them. Just five loaves and a couple of small dried fish and a very hungry multitude of people who had just heard a wonderful sermon from his lips. Sit them down and begin distributing the bread and the fish I have just blessed. They don't waste any of the bulk of the leftovers. Unsurpassed in concern for the people's physical needs. Weren't there ten of you blokes I healed from misery of leprosy, all in the one hit? So where are your other nine mates? You certainly did the right thing and came back to thank me, but I don't understand the thanklessness of the rest. Unsurpassed in his attitude of love, even toward the thankless. Amazing. But who touched me? The woman was desperate. She had been plagued by this physical problem for 12 years. 
Because of faith, Jesus was aware virtue had departed from him. This poor lady became completely healed in an instant and surpassed in honouring faith. His healing capability was immense and unparalleled, diverse and unsurpassed. He had not the slightest problem in the restoration of sight to the blind, to the deaf and dumb, faculties restored, to those stricken with palsy, complete physical restoration. A withered limb or the lame and the halt, no problem here either. All repaired and returned to normal. The poor individual, patiently waiting for the waters to move to effect healing. Take up your couch and get back to living a normal life. Compassion, compassion, compassion unsurpassed. However, I've merely scratched the surface of this very inadequate pen picture or portraiture of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And I'm sure you I'm sure you'll all be well aware there is one miracle I haven't referred to, which was probably his crowning act amongst humanity for he did even more than heal every type of sickness and disease. He went an incredible step further. But Lord, he's been dead four days now and beginning to decay and smell. Just carry out my instructions and remove the stone from the entrance of the cave because I happen to be the resurrection and the life. Lazarus, come forth. And indeed he did. You sisters can now remove the wrappings from off his new body. Then he can continue to once more live a normal life with the two of you. Unsurpassed in compassion, sympathy, confidence and love. And bearing his cross, he went forth into a place called the Place of a Skull, which is known as Golgotha. And there they crucified him. After three days, it was noted this other stone had been mysteriously moved away. It had been placed at the entrance to the tomb where Jesus had been resting in death. He had risen and gone forth unsurpassed in power, indescribable power, and resolve to carry on with the finishing touches to his plan of salvation. It's 40 days later, and while they looked steadfastly skyward into the atmosphere, Jesus begins to rise. He's soon passing through clouds and disappearing beyond and out of sight. He is heavenward bound, unsurpassed in generating hope and assurance to otherwise lost humanity. Mission impossible was now mission completed, except for a return visit to accompany the redeemed to his eternal city, which was to become their eternal home for a thousand years. And so I challenge each one of you here today to continue to develop a personal acquaintance with this Jesus Christ. Why? Because we will soon be privileged to meet him face to face in the clouds of glory as per the spectacular depiction of this in our frontal mural. Yes, Jesus Christ, friends, absolutely unsurpassed in every aspect of love, supreme, necessary for the salvation of fallen man, the express mission for which he had come to planet Earth, on time, as prophesied, 
some 2,000 odd years ago. The cross that awaited him then really belonged to each one of us here today. Thankfully, love supreme ruled. If I had one sermon left to share, well, this has probably been that sermon. Face to face in all his glory, we shall see him by and by. The beautiful hymn reminds us. Let's see how well we can sing it. Dismiss us with your blessing and be with us all and bless us all in the untried week ahead. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.